This is Kenya, the number one opera in the world, according to Foreign. You're watching Foreign Channel, also known as the number one existent fan in the world. Right, I'm here for another episode of Reflections, and my guest for this one is going to be Cuban, who is the coach of Apex, but he was also the coach of Virtus Pro, and then he had a very successful CS 1.6 career. Right, Cuban, I actually have a bit of an advantage over modern-day people interviewing you, because not only have I interviewed you in the past, but I also used to talk to you back in the day in 1.6, so I actually have some, like, secret info, which... We won't reveal all secrets, but I can I can ask you about some of these things anyway. So one thing people might not know about you is they might know if they're a really hardcore fan that like later on in the 1.6 lineups of the great teams you were playing with Neo and Taz, later on they let you become the in-game leader. And obviously now in CSGO, you transition to become a coach. But a lot of people might not be aware you were actually an in-game leader way before you even joined up with those guys and made the whole Golden 5 lineup. But an interesting detail is I remember seeing that you were an IGL though that didn't use like set tactics though. You just sort of like, it was just you. You just played off your feel and just made calls, right? Can you give me a sense of this? Were you, were you originally an in-game leader in CS? First of all, hello everyone. Um, was I in-game leader? Um, I think back in the days when I was starting playing Counter-Strike, it was in internet cafe and we were just playing with the friends and there wasn't something like in-game leading. I mean, back in the days, it wasn't even esports. It was just competition. So we were just coming with an idea of how to compete against whoever we're playing against. And we were just randomly thrown ideas. And I think it just naturally comes in whatever discipline you have. I mean, in team sports, let's say sports, esports, uh, when somebody has the best feeling of how to win the round, what unique tricks you may use to just be better than your opponent. You're just becoming a leader because you get the trust from, from the people you, you're around with. Uh, and yeah, I think before joining Pentagram G-Shock, I was also in-game leader for most of my teams. I've never thought that you could have been studying of how we were playing back in the days. Uh, you're a sport historian, so yeah, <laughs> this is an answer. Um, I would say uh, I was never maybe the one, the leader that I wanted to be a leader, it was more of a trust from my teammates. I was also playing uh, field hockey, it's called, the little stick on the grass. Uh, I know in UK it's it's pretty popular, but not in the, most of the European no, countries. No, no, yeah. Uh, and I was usually, I mean, first I was a striker, but then I became the central midfield uh, and who got the most trust from the coach as well. And I was just, you know... Uh, controlling the pace of the game, how do we play, and you know, being being naturally becoming a leader. And I think I just somehow naturally maybe I I had the skills to to become somebody who take who can take responsibility of of the team. And then I transferred this to 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 Counter Strike. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't remember that much history. I mean, in terms of Time frames, let's say, but from my seven pro seven years of professional playing for Pentagram G Shock and many other teams with Taz and Neo, I always I was always pretty sure I was in game leader for most of this period. So right. let's say four four years plus uh, with some uh, we were often changing. We are not changing yes. players, but changing the roles. So uh, Neo and Taz were also uh, in game leading for for some time. But I mean, from my perspective, as I say, I don't remember exactly. It was more than 10 years ago I, I quit. Uh, actually, no, without a month. It's 11 all good. years and 11 yeah. months. <laughs> it's all good. That's what I'm here for, man. I've yeah. got another question and, along uh, these lines then. So it mm -hmm. sounds okay. like what you're describing there. If people don't know this is actually a very traditional sports approach, which is everyone wants to be the striker in football or hockey and be the goal scorer. But what you tend to find is, unless you're just the most outrageously skilled player, usually it's more like, it's like, right, what other strengths do you have? Like maybe you could be a winger or a defender or famously, people don't know in soccer, it's always like usually the bad player has to start as the goalkeeper. And then if mm -hmm. they get really good, they get really good. So 
So I have a question along these lines. It seems like in Counter-Strike, this was just generally something you did because I remember you said in an interview that a commentator in a match once described you as the MacGyver, MacGyver. of Counter-Strike. <laughs> and the reason why I think this fits you so well is like when I look at your career, you basically did, it's almost in like, you know, in mobile games, they have the concept of a fill player. They just do whatever role you need in the team. And it's like you're in-game leader. You were the guy using the utility, the flashbangs. You would even sometimes CT AWP on maps like Trade. I remember, even though you weren't known as a famous AWP, but you were an entry player if you needed to be. It seemed like you just did whatever the team needed, right? That's actually true. Uh, when I was considering my path of my career, I would say I was taken to PGS, first of all, not as IGL, but as a guy who had a lot of ideas and was just this versatile guy who could uh, be a really good support and i just had a lot of initiative during the games uh, but i felt you know i was 18 years old back then i was mechanically really good as well i would say and uh, i'm not sure how accurate were statistics at Godfrak back then but when i was checking stats in 2016 i was second best player after new york oh, so okay. i would say Fair play. Uh, even though tas was like you know sure. insane insane guy as i mean together with alongside neo uh, but i had really good stats and i was never like the guy who was relying a lot of statistics uh, but this at least was something what was telling me that i was really good at this point uh, but it didn't mean that i wanted to be the superstar player uh, so I just probably took over in game leading role and uh, was helping more to make the make the most important decisions. What plan do we have for the round? I would say. I mean, you touched on it there. It's funny because the line that you just said there, like we weren't switching players, we were switching roles. They actually said in Virtus Pro famously, obviously when you were the coach of them as well, like they didn't kick the five players. They kept them in for years and years and years. They also did the same thing. They took turns. Like Snacks got to be the in-game leader. Then Neo was the in-game leader. And they t kept swapping it around. Now, one of the things I remember from talking to players back in the days, it's not necessarily like you were sat there and you all decided like who's the best in-game leader or who has the best tactics. As far as I know, like the reason why that line is a very clever line like we didn't switch players is wasn't part of it like when the team felt like they were stuck or like an example would be the certain superstar players might just be like hey i want to i want to go now and it's like that was kind of like a way to make it so you didn't have to kick people right it's a pretty important concept i think people maybe don't understand yeah that's true uh we we have started doing this uh, back then when i was playing as well within within the roles and uh, i would even say that at some point I mean, maybe not at some point, like throughout the careers, we, we have never had like set roles. You are going to be first, you are going to be last, you are supportive. Everyone, I mean, this is what also built and killed our team, I would say, that we, we tried to make one perfect player out of five different characters we had. Somebody who's shooting good, throwing good util, having good comms, who can call and everything. But at some point, I mean, this was something unique that allowed us to switch roles but this was also something which in my opinion at, at the end of 2013 killed our team because we kind of lost our identity we didn't have i i mean i i listen to polish rap and i like to bring some quotes from this and it's it's better to be really fucking good in one thing and decent or bad in multiple Yes. Then be average in everything. And I think this is something we sacrificed uh, too much to be decent and not the best, like using Neo in, you know, leaving him for clutches at this point, you know, in example, right? And having somebody maybe pass only as, a, as an entry and like me or Lord being supportive player. Uh, if we had maybe better structure, it could have lasted longer. But also then, if we only stick to one single role for everyone, we would have been changing players because Absolutely. somebody yep. could have been, you know, had some good and worse periods. So it has its own pros and cons. Uh, but yeah, this was this is something unique which helped you stay together for longer periods. But this is also not the uh, um, values of the best teams as well. I mean, the best. I mean consistently good let's say fnatic or somebody if they felt they have to change somebody they were just changing and the guy was jumping into somebody's shoes to replace yes. him and we're just more skilled in at this period let's say 
I mean, along these lines, so that's something I want to ask you about, because when I look not just at your lineup when you were the player in 1.6, but actually the Verts Pro lineup that was in CSGO, one of the things I think a lot of people admire about these lineups is because they didn't change players, even if people swapped around the roles, the style of the team or maybe the philosophy of Counter-Strike remained quite similar. And, and as a result, an advantage, it's funny, in the short term, the obvious advantage to changing a player is if someone's playing badly at that role, like you say, and you just bring in a world-class player at that role, I mean, the Swedish team used to do this all the time they might just win the next tournament but the difference is if you want to have like longevity and be really good for a long time that seemed like the sort of understanding your team had like i said of whatever the philosophy was became just beyond the other teams the other teams kept ch changing play they would even change star players what do you think about this like did you kind of have a group I identity as a team do you think <laughs> this is all this is also a good question because uh when i'm looking back there, because often people looking from behind, they think there is like big structure. This is like written down rules that we have to stick and nothing at all. Like it was just most of spontaneous decisions when somebody felt underrated. Maybe he felt like I need to change my role because I have no frax opportunities and <laughs> sure. I want to change my role. And then somebody else, okay, like I had a good tournament, so I'm feeling really confident that I can even switch my role back to something else and giving the space to the other guy. And I think it was more of this uh, decision making. Uh, but, uh, you know, thinking, I mean, just for for people watching, you didn't give me any any topics which we got. No, discuss, no, of course it's not. Also ex it's also exciting for me, uh, but I tried to do a little bit of reflection, and especially the former few few months are making me feel that. Uh, I mean, it's not about bragging, but this is this has to be reality. I have, let's say, some unique skill to, not like randomly. But it has to be something with me having the skills to know the people around me and just build the team naturally, knowing them, their personalities, their skills, and just putting the pieces of the puzzles into the correct place, which is making this team work. And I think I've done it really well in Apex, knowing the age of the players, the bringing young, young IGL and young, really skillful player, which I was also exploring this was me who brought him into the scene uh and i think at some point i heard a comment like this from one of the players girlfriend that uh he she said that to our manager that jakub has this skill to unite people uh to make them you know be a team and uh maybe it was underrated because we have never said that officially uh but i feel like uh, I just have this skill of, you know, making a team. Uh, I, do, I, I like. To, it's not about me being the, in the center of the of the attention. I just like people around me to succeed. And maybe it's also the father figure I have. When you have kids, kids, and you want them to be happy, and you have wife and family, and you need to take care of the things. This is when you are at the last spotlight, but you want everyone around you to be to be happy. Right. One thing I did want to ask about was when you did do the role swaps so other people talk about being an in-game leader, if people don't know, even Neo did it at one point in time, right? When you did this, if you look historically in the early period, this is why I wonder about that question you said before about where you, most of the time you were the in-game leader. Because the problem with this, some of this interview, right, is I'm going to phrase this very carefully, is one of the things that everyone loves about Taz, even some of his teammates, is he is an enormous character. He's, he is like a larger-than-life figure. And for the camera especially, this is a good thing, he actually knows how to be like a character. The funny thing is, I would actually describe him a bit like Cadian if people don't know. Like some of the stuff he's doing, he knows he's on camera, he's sort of like a wrestling character, he knows how to be bigger than life but and also sometimes that means all the hate goes his way etc but as a result I remember it was always told to me that like the early majors were all when Taz was the in-game leader and then you were at the end period when you won a couple and then obviously in, in CSGO they were swapping around in Virtus Pro right what was was Taz a good in-game leader was this something he did much from your memory uh, I mean this is far far behind and it's the past and uh, I don't want to say anything bad about Victor because sure. I really respect him for... This may be even something which 
I didn't maybe feel appreciation for what I am doing be because people were not realizing that this is me. I mean, let's say uniting the right. people. And maybe when he was calling or being a leader, we were also not appreciating, but it's always easy to say uh, from behind that somebody is not doing his things right. But let's just put yourself into his position and try to do it better. Then it's a problem. And this is often what's happening. Uh, I would say Colzera wanting to be IGL for Fallen. I mean, yep. and star players want uh, willing to be IGLs is often ending up in a failure because they think they will do it better because this is not their main responsibility. And I would say, uh, I mean, being fully honest, often when Victor was calling, I was over calling him and uh, we tried to make my calls being the, the last ones, let's say the, okay. the officials. But it doesn't mean that he was a bad caller because he was taking this responsibility of being a leader. So I had, let's say, less pressure, right? And uh, looking back, I think the figure like, like him was actually the key of the team existing as well. Because like he was this confident guy going into the camera and saying that we're going to win. Yep. And maybe we were laughing at it a bit that he's so confident and like, how can you know that we're going to win? <laughs> sure. Saying this, yes. it's, it's just subconsciously this is the word I learned from you from the interview from 15 years ago. <laughs> Subconsciously, uh, we were just becoming more confident. And this was his maybe acting, right? Or just him being himself. But it was just giving us extra confidence. So I would say, I, I mean, I wouldn't say he was a bad caller. I wouldn't say he was a great caller. But I think he was really the one of the really important key of the team uh, so we existed for so long yes and I'll also say because obviously a lot of fans are only going to know CSGO and they're only even going to know by now maybe even the end of Virtus Pro they're going to think that Taz is only that like he's just like the heart of the spirit of the team and he's a great camera what they don't know you alluded to it earlier is whenever people talk about these teams because Neo all the frag movies are so crazy people really do think it was like Neo fragging everyone and then you guys just running behind him or something like I don't think people realise Taz was a very very good player especially as like an entry player I remember one of the things I always thought was very admirable was he was a very fearless entry player as well. Like he, he was going against these best Swedish and Danish players. He was just running out there. Like, how would you describe him as a player in 1.6? Uh, Neo was always admiring him. So whenever we were saying, ah, maybe it's a time to change, like, you know, just okay. taking this, starting these discussions, he was always behind him saying that he's just insanely skilled. And this was right. Like he was super good in terms of shooting. Uh, and uh, maybe not answering exactly to your question, but each of us players, former players, thinks that the way we play the game is actually the one which has to be played. Let's say, like, we have our style because we think this is something which is the best, usually. But each of us has different style, and there is, like, same with personalities. There is no 5, 10, 20 different character uh, characters uh, in real life, there is like millions because every each of us has some unique skills, which is making him being like this personality. And the same with Victor, he was really he had the skill of being confident going for a fight. He always thought that he's gonna win, and he was dueling, as you said, like the best Swedish skilled players, and he was winning this duel. So whenever you felt the entry has to be make made. He was just going for the fight, like get, getting this AK and winning, buying some extra deagle when IGL is saying full eco, you know, and he was he was uh, finding the skills. Uh, so as a player, definitely. One one thing <laughs> I can tell you a bit, uh, a little story. One thing we realized actually in CSGO was that uh, when he was checking the corners, let's say every player is going with his crosshair into the corner, you're going to yeah, yeah. perhaps spot the guy but Taz was going with his crosshair like 45 degree but checking the corner with his eyes <laughs> and we realized okay. that at some right. point that this was like a <laughs> unique way of, of spotting sure. uh, opponents maybe because of low sensitivity uh, I don't know but it was one one funny funny fact we realized pretty late it was like 2017 18 maybe uh, that he was just surprised being caught off guard by the guy sitting in the corner. Uh, but this is also this entries uh, 
habit that they are not checking everything because usually they go first, so they already know where the opponent is going to yes. be, and somehow they are lost in clutch rounds because you know you, you need to check every corner. You don't yes. go just straight forward. Uh, yeah, I I don't know what much I can add about Victor, but he was definitely one of the best aimers I've ever uh, experienced playing with. Right. Um, normally, this is another player that gets ignored in your team is obviously Lord. And by the way, I'm sure he himself would say as much. Like I've noticed, you'll notice a trend if you're a fan watching this now is, even though it's great to all win the championships and in theory, that's all that matters. Eventually, people want credit as well. They don't want it to just sound like it was like, like they don't want it to seem like it was the Jackson 5 and Neo was Michael Jackson and then you guys are all the other ones people don't remember the name of with just the surname Jackson. You want to believe you're all contributing because this is one of the greatest teams ever. So I know in Lord's case, the sad thing about him is because of the era when you were winning, this was when people did just start to check stats and they would look at the stats. And this is when we didn't even have the terminology that I've like done in a lot of my videos of the roles and how you make a team. Really, people really did think back then. It wasn't a joke on forums. They thought you just put the five most skilled players in a team and you just win the tournament. I, I actually think even some of the Swedish players thought that. It seemed to be what they did over and over. But the sad thing is, it's only actually, I think, when Senya and Navi came along, people started to realise... Maybe that Lord guy did do something because you could see from Senya and Navi, he wasn't close to the most skilled player, but he was doing this, what we'd call the supportive aspects of the game. He's very good at it. And I always thought the thing that was really underrated about Lord was this was a player where even if the frags aren't high and he's having to do like the, the bad rolls, what a, this guy must have won so many clutches in majors and big finals. Like it, he could be one v one against Forest and win the games. So can give me some thoughts. I know he's a guy that goes back way back, even before the Golden Five with you. Yeah, uh, he was, uh, I would say, we met at two in 2004, I think, uh, because both of us were uh, under consideration into joining the Golden 5 lineup. And I think since I was, let's say, when I was playing with him, I don't remember the names, like DBR and some other teams, I was even like, you know, kicking him from the team because <laughs> okay. of his behavior and... Long story, long story short, he was playing alongside me uh, for two, three years before joining PGS. Uh, and as you said, like he was always really good at clutches. He was good entry. Back then, there was no one specific role. Players were just trying to play, but he was really versatile player, really skilled as well. Maybe not as mechanically good as uh, Taz or Neo, uh, but he was having a game feeling, I would say. He had this game sense of how to... He wasn't like... You no, know, going for clear <coughs> duels, but he was just knowing how to win the round. I would say, like, there is teams who knows how to win in football, and teams who wants to score the most goals. Like, it doesn't matter if you win 10-0 uh, or 1-0, and you win the final, and you are at the trophy. You know, uh, so I would say, when he joined the team, he could have been the missing puzzle, but they still were missing one which was I, <laughs> uh, it ended up on me joining the team six months or five months later after him. Uh, this is when it clicks and we were always, you know, we knew each other for so long and uh, both of us were, I think Lord said, said that in one of the interviews that a player he always appreciated spending his career with was me because he felt we both kind of by, by the understanding of the game and by the influence we brought into the best Polish team, we kind of built the way of, let's say, meta for Polish Counter-Strike or meta of how we want to play the game regarding, you know, defaulting and set threats, mixing it up, changing the pace and really confident way of playing the game. Uh, probably this is also, I mean, maybe this will sound real Polish, but we, most of us will were grown like not on the street being homeless but we we're just spending all of the free time outside and this is when you kind of have to be tricky clever and find the ways of winning by not only being you know the biggest guy in the neighborhood and beating everyone but even though you can be small and skinny you can also win by having some tricks. And this is how... All right. This is, in America, they call it street smarts. It's the idea, like, you have to know how to navigate the situation. And obviously, like you said, you could get beaten up yeah. if you just go head on with someone. You have to be, yeah. be have guile. Yeah. And, and have this feeling. And 
I think even throughout the throughout the years, uh, even talked about it to get right at the major after party that uh, even though they were the best team in 2009, and the only one trophy they needed to complete the year's success was winning WCG. And this is when Polish guys coming, winning it. And also, like, the other factor was maybe us. Like, we both didn't come from, let's say, uh, I wouldn't even call them, which is, like, the complete opposite. We came from poor families. And we always, lack of money, never got, like, many stuff from, from our parents. And... Uh, the need of having more money and better life was always driving us through the competition and helping us finding this uh, bigger willingness to succeed and spending way more time in front of the pieces, which was our escape from, from the past, let's say. Uh, and like it's it's worth notifying noticing that we are not like bad guys. We're just, you know, little teenagers spending time outside playing football just just to avoid spending time at home maybe with i'm not sure about marius but uh, my father was drinking a lot of alcohol i'm not like afraid of saying this he was an alcoholic so i always was i was always ex escaping and also uh i lost my mother when i was 17 so right. i was kind of on my own with my father being alcoholic and also driver truck driver so i was a lot at home alone but when he was coming back, there was problems. So I was just escaping into gaming. And uh, this is what, I mean, I'm, I'm really grateful for the opportunity I get because uh, I could have ended in way different place. Uh, but thanks to the hard work and dedication and belief and the confidence, uh, I ended up, ended up in the place I am right now. And regarding Lord, I would say, uh, when we stopped playing, uh, I made the choice. It was really hard, but I said, like, I'm not going to play anymore, not knowing that Valve will be an uh, integral part of community development, give, making majors and a lot of opportunities for the players to, to grow. Uh, and then when I came back, I, I was offered to be a player many times, but I said, oh, no, okay. I, I want to be I want to be a coach. Uh, and with this puffing, I'm continuing. And now I'm coaching for longer than I was a player. So it's it's also interesting. Uh, and Lord, he tried to continue playing. I said, I either play in the best team with my former teammates or I do not play at all. And Lord tried to play. It wasn't a successful period. And I think maybe, I mean, I, I don't want to judge, but in my opinion, it was the right moment to stop playing. Probably he believed that he can achieve uh, more with, with the other lineups. But uh, if he went coaching as early as I did, in my opinion, he could have been uh, also international coach for, for better teams as well. But I mean, it's never too late. Uh, I'm not talking with him that often. He was also coaching King when they have beaten us yeah, in true. WSVG and they, they had some success as well. Uh, but it was me going with former teammates <coughs> as well. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I am sure he's happy. He has lovely family. He has two daughters, and uh, yeah, I, I I really love the guy, and we had really great uh, past together. And we are always friends, sharing the room, and nothing bad to say about him. <laughs> Right. Oh, one thing that's interesting about life in general is, when, especially when you're young, you only know how you perceive the world. You don't always know actually how other people see you or how they perceive you. So you might actually have a totally different sense. So I'm going to use a very extreme example here, but you know that famous one where when you won the World Cyber Games you're talking about, even though you guys won the match, because Lord was pissed off at Get Right for some trash talk or something, famously he like sort of like was like, like actually coming up to him like, hey, what's up, motherfucker, Bisky in Polish, right? Which to be fair, Get Right doesn't speak Polish, so you wouldn't understand what it said. But to be fair, you know, body language, you could see what he was sort of saying, right? I don't know if you know this, but back then, a lot of the best players, because a lot of them were Scandinavian, were really shy nerds or they were from like nice families or they were actually from like wealth and stuff and they were actually used to a very safe life. And I don't know if you know this, but in your in case of your team, it wasn't just in the game that you guys seemed unbeatable. You actually had like an intimidating aura outside of the game as well. Like, did you know this? Did you guys play it up at all? Uh, <laughs> I think we knew it. Uh, I mean, 
As Polish people, we probably, since we are only traveling to Scandinavia for boot camps, uh, for a few times probably in uh, Inferno Online. In 2008, we were in Meteor Makers. Uh, we were still teenagers. It was different times. Nothing to hide. We are boot camping and partying. And if we won some tournaments, we're also going to clubs and partying. But we still were, I mean, I'm not sure if like being Polish is the thing, but growing up in Central Europe or Eastern, Southern Europe, like now when I'm older, I, I can kind of divide Scandinavia way of life, living into, I mean, divided from Spanish, Italian, French are different. Yes. Now I know all the cultures because I traveled so, uh, for so much and I can divide it. And I know how to behave in all of the countries, let's say. Right. And uh, back then, we didn't care about it, and we knew we had this aura. We wanted to, uh, especially Luke, you know, like he was the oldest. Oh, like, of course. That's why he had the mohawk and everything. Yeah, yeah, of course. He was playing it up like a motherfucker. Yeah. yeah. So he, he was playing the bad guy. So, yes, we were bullying our opponents before the game. Uh, a bit, of course, like not nothing, no violence. No, no, just uh, for fun, sure. But, yeah. Uh, but I would say we are not that aware how cozy and how politically perfect they they tried to be in the the perfect life they were living i mean not, not as we were having way worse than them yeah sure this. and this uh reaction from lord it was something natural for us that happened on every single land in poland people were just right acting like yes. this and then for Swedish people, seeing this behavior from, from the Polish guy was unacceptable. And yes. they, they probably were scared, right? Like I, I saw there was a lot of uh, like uh, Fnatic owner, uh, Sam Matthew, right? Yeah. He was also uh, doing some intervention and helping the players to just split. Uh, oh, yeah. Like, I would say it's like in football in 90s. Like, I... Uh, who was telling me, Jacob, about Roy Keane, like how aggressive he oh, was. Course, and there was yeah. just some some players acting like this and the others who are really quiet and calm and they just they are just there to play. But some other players are bringing this anger into the competition as well. I think back in the days, I was also a bit like that. Maybe not like insulting people and again, worth mentioning, no violence no, no, of ever. Uh, but I was maybe getting this motivation, extra motivation, when you kind of, not like hated, because we were, uh, we had this quote, like uh, we said in Polish, maybe some Polish people will understand, we were saying, szacunkiem, ale bez respect, which is like, with respect, but without. So we can respect them out of the server, but never respect right. their opponent on the server, which is actually the thing I'm doing with my players right now, like never respect them, like let's just play our style. And if it's disrespectful for them, it's their problem. Because if we, are, uh, as long as we are winning, this is what is working against this uh, certain team. And uh, yeah, I think it's just cultural differences which was causing an uh, issues. Uh, if we played as Polish Polish team in Russia, acting like this, it would, <laughs> it sure. it would It'd be like whatever. Yeah, exactly. Height, maybe, or <laughs> yeah. Along these lines, though, I actually do think it's another factor that helped your team, though, because actually, if people don't know, you guys were like the Swedish killers. All the great Swedish teams you used to beat them in the majors, even if they were the favourites. And one factor I have to say is, like, this is another area where Taz actually had an effect that people wouldn't see inside the demo. Like, you, like the most famous examples were, like, you know, like those E-Stars tournaments where you would literally be playing the tournament, like, you could just see the other guy. He was, like, over the other side, or his desk was there, right? Taz wouldn't just kill people in the game. He would just be shouting, especially to to get right for some reason get right was always the target here and what what and he would just you know if you got a kill well, get right is your mouse working is the mouse working get right and the problem with people wouldn't know if they're a fan is that actually did affect these players i'm pretty sure i used to be stood behind them sometimes they're not used to that they used to like dying in the game and then you know they think about it think about next round they're not used to someone actually sort of like heckling them or trying to annoy them etc and i think some players it did push them off their game a little bit maybe it maybe it annoyed them or just frustrated them or took their head out of the game or something right uh, I would say definitely, and this is what I like about uh, LAN events as well. And often, often there is uh, questions like, should Counter Strike be played in the booths on the stage? And I definitely say no. Like you are coming to different environment. This is why we have LAN tournaments. 
that people can help you with booing or be against you. And I would I, I don't know what's trolling I think back then, but we were just trolling people and trying to play with them mentally outside. And this is of course which makes you feel weak when you know that the guys will be laughing at you and when you don't have strong mentality and you are not prepared for it, of course you will play worse. And as you say, like if the get right, maybe not consciously, but get right was a target for us because he was their best player. So if you make him play worse, this is when you can win the win the games, right? And this was mind games, good from good mind games from our side and uh, nothing said, just us being us and it was working. Right, one thing that I always thought was quite interesting was you alluded to it earlier, right? Even though this team in 1.6 has this almost perfect record, like Luke got kicked out eventually. If you hear some of the stories behind the scenes, it doesn't surprise me. And obviously, officially, you got kicked like briefly in 2008 and they brought in that PNS guy and then you got to come back late because they didn't do well at the Lance. But as you said, right, I heard a story from you years ago that like Lord was kicked, but like for a weekend or something, you know, or he quit or something. And then like he was back in by like the one day and there were definitely stories where Taz was like this close to maybe he got kicked out. Basically, as far as I can tell, only Neo wasn't going to get kicked out of the team. Like, as much as that, you know, that one thing I always thought your team said, and Virtus Pro said this, it was a very clever way to phrase it, is you would always say like, oh, we're like brothers. But I always thought what fans miss about that is, right, the difference between a brother and your best friend is, your best friend, you've got to be friends with them. There's no relationship there. With your brother, you can have a fight with your brother and then just come back next week and be like, right, let's put that behind us, you know, like we are brothers. Like, it's was there this element inside the team? Like, people are going to think because the lineup stayed together. You were all just the most perfect friends, never any arguments. It sounds to me like it was really spicy behind the scenes sometimes, especially if you lost the tournament, obviously. Uh, yeah, I would I would compare it to, like, for the people who, who does not follow, didn't follow 1.6, it's a bit of Navi way of uh, handling with things when they lose. Uh, I know that they are arguing a lot even yeah, nowadays, yeah. right? And uh, it's just cultural difference, which is not visible for people watching from 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 behind and uh, yes definitely we're arguing a lot having verbal fights and a couple of physical maybe uh but you know just <laughs> pushing each other not like re real fist fight <laughs> uh but this was always for for the sake of winning and uh in poland we say that as a kid when you f fight with somebody this is usually uh, the guy who are becoming friends with you because right you are just not afraid of, uh, it's not about showing who is better, but about mm, ending up in the situation, which is like the last, mm, I mean, if verbal talk doesn't help, you just go too far and then it breaks. And then you at some point have to, have to find a common language. I mean, either you don't talk to each other at all, or you are becoming friends. And uh, the willingness and this drive to success was so high in this team that nobody cared if you insult somebody or, uh, I mean, arguing was always an issue. And we knew how to end up these things, when, especially when we joined server, everyone forgets about the problems. I mean, not always, because at some point, I remember like 2012 or 13, when let's say you stay 2v2 with somebody and then you know that, all right, I must go first or I must offer him a flash because in 2009, he said that I never help, you know. Okay. And at some point <laughs> when you play for so long with, with your teammates, this, these things will come to, to your brain and distract you from... Uh, from just doing your things, the, the first thing which comes to your mind when you are a player is usually the best thought and the best thing you can make. And uh, later, when you have too many thoughts, you're just simply overthinking. Your decision making is worse. Uh, you are double guessing every single decision. And uh, this game is played of momentum, confidence, and just belief in, in the first thought you have. Uh, 
yeah. I don't know, was it an answer? Yeah, it's good. I've got a little follow-up as well, because actually, obviously, in theory, the only people who knew these arguments were going on were either people who understood Polish or were stood behind you at the tournaments. Like Back then, obviously, mainly it was demos. We all watched. There weren't as many streams. But actually, when I was a journalist and I was at an event, it was that World Esports Masters in China. I famously caught on video, because I used to be able to stand on the stage. I caught a little clip, which, look, SK Gaming website doesn't even have it anymore, but it's on YouTube. And the best thing is, some fan came in and put the translation of what you both said right when the pause up and you're all arguing and people from the west would just mind blown dude because the translation of what like lord is saying is some crazy shit like which pig threw that flash in my face like and they're just arguing like and telling and saying stuff that like like i say would seem crazy to another team but it seems like in your team like you say that was just like that wasn't every day but that just happened that was just the way things went in a match when it's going badly right yeah I remember, I remember it was 15 years ago, as you say, WM, no, 14, 2009. It was nine, yeah. This is when we brought Pasha as a stand-in for us, I think. Uh, Yeah, Uh, and this was also a moment when I was supporting and, you know, I think I blinded Lord, he died, we lost an eco. And yes, he was yelling at me, why are you always flashing? You always (laughs) try to make it perfect. And... And I was like, yeah, why are you running first? Because it's an eco and you want to find eco frags. So this is already a thing which are staying in your head. And this is an example of, I probably could have blinded him five times last few years. And I also knew that he is playing for the stats because somebody had better stats. And this is when stats were also already in, yep. maybe in Nature TV, not sure, like Godfrag probably. Uh, so players wanted to be, spotted by the audience more so they were just running after frags which i never understood um i mean i understand but this is not what giving you a price long term um and yeah like we just argued and probably we lost the game but we took the lesson from it and probably played better the next time (laughs) it just happens you learn on the mistake you don't need to you know change players or kick just kick people Uh, you just learn and you move forward Right, obviously people with eyes and a brain can just go and watch a frag movie of Neo or download the demos and they can see how skilled he is. But I actually always want to know for you guys, like like I said, I set it up earlier. Unfortunately, because people just only ever made it out like it was Neo, I noticed in a lot of the interviews over the years, it was like people were trying to sort of be like, yeah, we were good as well. Like we were quite skilled too because people made it sound like you guys were noobs and he was just a god and you were just following him around. But one thing I do want to ask is this, when you actually would be on his team, did you actually were you able to have the sense I've always, it's actually something believe it or not I once tried to explain to Simple back in the day when he was like fragging out but then he was a terrible teammate to his teammates I used to say dude if, the reason why if you don't flame them that your teams will just instantly win more games is because when you flame them you lower their confidence but they're supposed to look down like the line between the rounds and see you and go dude we can't lose if he's on our team like look at the way he's playing like it'll actually give you more confidence I always wondered if you play with Neo do you actually think like like he's the best player when you play with him. Do you, can he do anything in the game and, and win you any match? Mm-hmm. Uh, when you play with him, you definitely think like this. Uh, but yeah, he was definitely the best. But you never played with Forrest uh, True. in the team as well. So nobody knows who was better unless you played with both for a longer period. Uh, and you never knew who had, the, I mean, which teammates are helping him become a great player as well. And true. G- giving all the credit to get right uh, for being top one, I think it was his teammates giving him opportunity to make this highlights and lurking and you know having super high impact plays. Uh, and yes, he was gifted, but not not as much as Forrest and get uh, and Neo who could have won games on their own. Uh, I mean, I would say now there is more players like this who can just carry their team. Uh, maybe not as consistent as them. He was just a few steps ahead of everyone. Like I, I remember when I was playing in Internet Cafe, and it was just natural thing for us to go Friday and Saturday nights to be in a cafe, like from 10 p.m. up to 6 a.m. in the morning. And Neo's father, parents, their own cafe. So he was playing with some colleagues in i mean friends in, in in the cafe and his team was playing against my team we didn't know each other we just knew it's neo and his friends and whenever we were just going with five he was killing four three <laughs> f- sometimes five okay. of us and he was just as good as uh, 
probably simple in his prime time when he could have won every every single round on his own. Uh, yeah, so he was good, really, really good. But we don't know how much impact we had on helping him and creating the situations for him because when the structure is made, it also it's definitely team effort, not only one player. You, it's like with the strikers in football. You have to pass him the Absolutely. ball at some point. And yes. uh, you, he cannot just go. I mean, that's actually an interesting thing because at some point, uh, what was it? when Coldvera was the best player uh, in the rankings, and I was talking with Tas Nio Pasha, uh, who is the best player in your opinion? And all of them said fair because For he skill. goes first, yeah. he killed two or three, yes. and they were defining player skill but the uh, mm, player skill by uh, the skill of finding yeah. entries like going dry yeah. for the first duel and killing as much and fair was really good at it colzera yes it was nice i mean colzera was winning rounds but fair was finding the skills yes so and this is the opposite like as you ask for lord like lord was more colzera and tas was more fair in example Yes. Yeah. By the way, along these lines about Neo, you mentioned it there that he came, his parents had an internet cafe. I don't know if you've heard this piece of information about Zewu, but it sounds like something out of a movie where basically he was actually born on the day that CS 1.6, the game was like released as retail. So it makes it sound like a movie, like he's like Jesus in the Bible or something, you know, like, and then there will be born a child. People, if people don't know, I actually, when I heard the backstory of Neo, that's what I thought in 1.6 because I heard there's this amazing Polish, but like, who the fuck? Like, at the time, you know, this like back in the day Poland was irrelevant it was all like Sweden Norway maybe USA Germany and so I was like how good could this guy be and then when I saw how good he was I heard I actually I even got to know his dad a little bit I heard this backstory that he actually was like a little kid that like grew up in a land cafe and part of the reason they even had the land cafe is because they could see he had like an interest in CS and he was really good and he was playing with his dad and all these older people and he was growing up in the game it almost makes it sound like the same thing like he's actually like Neo in the Matrix like he was supposed to be like the chosen one or something and then in some ways, if you look in some of the teams, it does seem like everyone in the team understood, like, we have to, like, make this guy comfortable and we have to help him and support him. Did you actually have a sense that he was, like, some special player? Um, special. I mean, <clears throat> the first day I saw him playing, let's say 2002, two, three, maybe, he was already the best player. And <laughs> okay. he was best when I was watching him. He was the best when I was uh, playing with him. And then when, I mean, when I was coaching him, he was already IGL for for the almost all the period. But he was always the superstar in my eyes, and uh, not sure how to describe. But everyone wanted to play alongside him, and every Polish player' dream was to join us and play with us or play for Virtus Pre later, uh, knowing that this is Tasni or later probably people were praising Snacks more. Uh, but yeah. He was he was the best. <laughs> it's like probably like joining Ronaldo and I mean his prime time like probably City or early Real Madrid times, and just it's it's a pleasure to be surrounded by this guy. Uh, and his I mean his game knowledge and looking at him how how to play is different when you play with the guy in the team and listen to him or see him perform and different experience when you just watch. Right, one of the funny things that a modern fan won't believe, because Pasha became such a fan favourite, and even to this day, he's still such a big name, is that when Pasha first joined your team, because with Luke, he'd won all those championships, and initially, it took a while to adapt, a lot of people were actually flaming him, and were like, get this guy the fuck out of the team, I'm like, what's he doing? And I noticed, if you ever go and look in the actual demos, it's because the two players couldn't be more different. Like, on paper, they're both Orpers, right? But if you ever watch Pasha's start, it's actually a bit like it was in CSGO, He's like super aggressive. He like rushes in. He's not like the guy taking the double scope up from a million miles out. He's doing like the fast, like quick scope almost and like the single scope onto someone. Meanwhile, if people ever watched, Lord was almost what people in the modern day would call like the support opera. He would like only play on certain CT sides. I know it's on T sides. Sometimes he was just, just literally the guy watching the back with an AK. He was just making sure no one can flank. And so I can imagine if you put the, like it's, you know, in the term like plug and play, if you try to take Pasha and just put him into Lord's spot, I can imagine it wouldn't work at all, right? It must have taken some time to figure out how to use these different players, right? Yeah. I mean, Pasha could maybe use the utility. Uh, not as good as Lord, but he had this 
game feeling with like how to flash of the time, maybe more of the timing because he was also lurking and the first one of the first guys uh, sitting in the smokes, just fading, finding timings, doing this extraordinary moves, which opponents were never expecting uh, and kind of maybe set meta playing around, not, I mean, Hinem snacks, I would say they started to play a lot, uh, a lot in the smokes. But putting him into Lord's role, uh, I mean... Oh, I meant Luke, sorry. Uh, Luke. Uh, Pasha and Luke, okay. Yeah, so oh, did I say Lord? I meant Luke for yeah, that yeah. example there, because obviously there were the two orpers. Yeah. yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Luke was the was good guy playing in one spot, I would say, and Pasha was always this mobile, but this is the same with... It depends on personality. Luke liked to sit in, in the room and just play video games, and Pasha, he just played CS and... I mean, he played a lot, but he was also spending a lot of time outside. And now you see him, you know, hiking, biking, uh, <laughs> playing football, sure. uh, doing whatever, everything at the same time. And this was also the same thing in game. He was really unpatient. Uh, of course, with the time uh, moving forward, he learned. And also when I was already coaching, uh, we had a lot of discussion how to play the game. And he was the guy like I would compare with personality a bit with Jacob now. Okay. Uh, they are unpatient, but they are also most keen to talk CS. And I love to talk CS with people. And, you know, when we see something observed, knowing how to react. And I, I think JKM improved. I mean, even though he had probably had similar ratings, that's an interesting thing whenever you check his stats since like 2018. 112, 113, 112, 113. 112. Oh, very consistent. Always yeah. consistent, very consistent player. But now he grew, he, he never wanted to end up in platforms. And I said, leave your comfort zone, like just try. And I mean, it's not like that we tried to set him into clutches, but the more he's staying at them, he's winning most of them recently. And it was the same with Pasha. First, he was only going like no scoping, trying to like on nuke, let's say, replay default on nuke. And he was the first guy running outside, sneaking into main and trying to kill people on A. Like what opera does it, right? <laughs> but he was just, you know, throwing one here, one flash here, one flash there, just finding this timing that for three seconds he had time to sneak. And this was his style in the beginning. When tier one hits him in the face, this is when he struggles for a few months. I think this Easter tournament in Seoul, the one we mentioned before, was uh, as a Europe we lost, but as an individual team we have won. But it took us like six, seven months to suit him into not only our playstyle, but himself being comfortable in tier one way of playing CS uh, back, back in the days. By the way, one thing I want to ask about is I feel like people are, who didn't know who Pasha is always had totally the wrong perception because since they always saw he had big muscles and like I say, all the Polish guys were like looking tough like a rap video or something. Everyone used to always say to me, right, when I was on events like bantering people, like, oh, watch out, like Pasha will beat you up if he sees it. It's like, bro, Pasha's probably the nicest guy ever to meet at events. It was always being lovely to me at after parties. Even as a joke was always telling me like, you should just come to the next kind of eat event. I'll look after you, don't worry, you know? Like, and so, <laughs> I think because of like the MMA fighting now, people really think he's like a mean guy or he's beating people up or something. I don't know if Pasha, except for MMA fights, I don't know if Pasha's ever beaten anyone up. Isn't he like the sweetest guy ever? Uh, I mean, as a teenager, I, I won. I know he was uh, not like a scary guy beating everyone, but he was fighting for him. Oh, own. okay. He grew up, he grew up on the, not, I mean, it isn't like a countryside, you know, uh, with fields around, but it was a small village. Okay. 2,000 people only, and this is different than growing in the city in Poland. And uh, I would say it's, I would compare, let's say, Kiev and outside of Kiev. It's, or Moscow and outside of Moscow. It's it's way different uh, environment, uh, and you need to fight for yourself even more. So he knew how to, how to find his place. And I mean, uh, people are also growing and changing, but I know like one funny thing was, maybe he was for six months, maybe a year in our team. And we were not like arguing with him, but saying things, how he can improve and become better player. And often uh, extroverted people, they fight for themselves instantly instead of just, you know, having some reflection, maybe uh, realizing, doing some uh, self-confession of, 
what did he literally told me? Maybe I can think over and give the right answer. And instead, Pasha, as this Im uh, impulsive guy, he was just, if you want, you can kick me. I don't need this money. I don't need this team. I will just okay. come back home and play. I will do my okay. thing. If you don't want to, you know, and and quit and going into the room. Okay. <laughs> so, and then, you know, he needed some time to think. Then we came came to his room and talk again and just explain that we want this to improve. This is how you, uh, you make a step forward. You need to reflect. You need to find solutions, not only seeing the problem. And then you are joining another game and you're improving. And this is how you step by step becoming a better player. This is when he starts learning, in my opinion. And at some point, as, as we all know, 2014, he was third, four, no, third best, best player in, in the world which we're always laughing that with snacks, is it better to be one time third or two time fourth? Okay. And we, we always said one time third is better. Okay. okay. <laughs> because it's top three. Yeah, true. <laughs> As Mary J. Blige said in her track, All I Need, you're all I need to get by, which is the case for me and my Patreon community who support this channel and these videos. Some of them include Theogeny, Matt Pognaccio Rakula, Ahmed Haju, Joseph Adcock, Tosh, Bot Pounder 420, Toucan, Animosity, Tobias Bernasconi, Jensen Gore, Yurka, and a special thanks always to the main man, Jerky's Minion. Would you like to ask a question in my regular video AMA? Do you want teasers? Find out who upcoming guests are. Maybe you want to suggest a topic or a guest for my content, or you want to take part in one of those longer esports discussions with me where we go all over the place. Well, if any of those grab your fancy, put your money where your mouth is, join the Risk Illuminati today via the Patreon link in the description box below.